listen without solving is really important because the tendency for, for a lot of people is when somebody comes to you with an issue and, and a lot of HR people, I think that would be the case, the immediate response is to try and find a solution to the problem when in fact that may not be what you need. Don't conduct your analysis in isolation because data is so incredibly powerful. Not defending just the tribe, but defending the organization. Those creative people that you really want to keep empowered, keep excited, keep motivated, keep thinking. A good experience pays dividends down the line. Stereotypes tend to break down in proximity. Welcome to We're Only Human, a podcast about human resources, business, technology, and the workplace. My name is Ben Eubanks, your host, and I'm so glad you're here. Hey everyone, it's Ben Eubanks, host of We Are Only Human, and I'm so glad you're here today. I'm excited for today's conversation because we're going to dive into HR leaders kind of day in the life. We're going to talk about what's like in their organization, their industry, and it's an area that I have not spent time in personally or professionally, so I'm curious to dive into this. So I have here with me Gordon Simpson. He is the SDP of Human Resources for the Americas region for uh, DHL. So Gordon, welcome, sir. Thank you. So I'm, I'm in the DHL Global Forwarding Division. There are four other divisions that, that form part of the, uh, the DP DHL group. So I look after the, uh, the forwarding business here in the Americas region. Okay, excellent. See, already it, it's a tremendously complex organization, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to learn some fun things, I can tell, in the conversation today. So why don't you go ahead and give us a little bit of insight into who you are, what you do, and when you're not, when you're not uh, – at work, what's something fun that you enjoy personally? So just give us a little bit of background on you. I look after human resources for the uh, the Americas region, and then I have a, a global role as well as the lead for employer relations, industrial relations for the global forwarding division. So that keeps me pretty busy. It keeps me in contact with, with what goes on in the rest of the world, and it allows me to keep an open mind in terms of uh, some of the HR issues that, uh, that we face on a global basis. Outside of work, I have uh, a couple of young grandchildren who I really appreciate spending time with. And I'm a very keen golfer. I also thoroughly enjoy cooking and, and I read quite extensively. So those are the things that I like doing. Exciting. Both at work and not fun. I've got to clarify just to make sure I got this one correct. Because you said cooking. I've, I have been, I actually insulted someone because I said cooking and baking and use them interchangeably. So you prefer cooking over baking. Is that correct? I do. I do. <laughs> <laughs> Although my baking skills have, uh, have improved somewhat now. I'll tell you a little story. We, uh, we were looking for things to, to do with staying connected with, with our America's management team. And, and so one of the things that I taught them to do was to, how to bake banana bread. And for, for many of those folks who said they, they even boil water when they try and boil it, it was a great experience and, and came out really well, which was a lot of fun. That is so fun. That's one of our kids' favorites. So that is great. I love that. It's been really intriguing to hear the different ways people have tried to stay connected over time. Mm -hmm. And I'm beyond the just another happy hour. I'm looking for other kinds of examples and stories and things. That's a fun one to to leave in there. I love that. So tell me more about about the talent focus at DHL, because again, it's one of those things people generally are aware of, right? They've seen a truck go by or they've got a delivery at one point, but we only see this little snippet from our consumer perspective. Talk about it from a talent perspective. What's a focus for you and for the team there at DHL? Mm-hmm. Okay, so I think 2020 pretty much changed uh, the way we thought about a lot of things, as you can imagine. And I think for us, the most critical aspect of last year was, was the health and safety of our employees. We had about 60% in, in the forwarding business of our employees working from home. And, and that happened literally overnight. And we went from people working in the office in the middle of March of last year. And that was on the Friday. On the Monday, the vast majority of people were working from home. And that, so that was a very different world that uh, people had entered into. So I think for us, the, some of the key drivers around talent are, we have a goal to become a great place to work for everyone. And of course... Part of that whole thing, when we talk about for everyone, the developments in the U.S. around diversity, equity, and inclusion changed fundamentally last year, I think, with what happened with the Black Lives Movement. So there's been a huge focus on the whole area of diversity, equity, and inclusion in 2020, and I think that will continue with us uh, into the future for sure. Employee engagement, I think, was really important, and I'll maybe talk a little bit about that later on, but this idea of people being able to stay connected. And for us, it was quite intriguing because our organization's purpose is staying connected and improving that will improving lives. And so it's simply stated as connecting people, improving lives. And 
I think during this COVID period, that has become very true because having been classified as an essential industry, we continue to work as normal. Operations continue to, uh, to operate. And thinking about COVID, in the first phase of that, we were bringing protective equipment or personal protective equipment in to the U.S. And then during this whole period with the rise of e-commerce, that was a, a big focus for, for pretty much the, the remainder of the year after the shutdown. And then, of course, now it's, it's distribution of vaccine. It allows people to really understand what we do as an organization and be able to connect to that. And I think that's been extremely helpful to us during this past 12 months. And then I think one of the other areas is around data analytics, digitalization, and virtual development. In the pre-COVID days where people attended training programs and so on and any development programs most of those were done on a face-to-face -face basis. Obviously, we did have a lot of programs that people could do remotely, but I think the past 12 months have, have highlighted for us that there's, there needs to be a shift in the way in which we think about how we develop our talent. So th the ideas of attract, retain, and develop, if you think about attraction, it's very different operating in the world we do today because much of it is virtual. So onboarding, recruiting, all of those things have, have taken on somewhat of a different perspective. And then I think in terms of the, of the development piece, I mentioned engagement, a lot of those activities around, you know, developing our leaders. For many leaders in the organization, they'd never had to manage in a remote kind of situation before. So that changed things for a lot of people. And then I think from a talent point of view, being sure to stay connected with people and being able to assess readiness for future roles is, is a key part of that. So those are some of the things that we've, we've had to really spend a lot of time and attention on in the, in the past 12 months. And I think a lot of them will continue into the future because we're certainly not out of the woods yet as far as COVID is concerned. No, sir. I would agree with that for sure. Mm -hmm. So if you don't mind, I'd like to dive into that development piece just a little because one of the things I'm always curious about... You mentioned, you know, that, that some of the team members that had an office sort of role were able to adapt to, to go home. But at the same time, there were people who were had to don some sort of equipment and get in, get to work because they had to be at a physical location. Mm -hmm. And the, the piece I want to talk about is the development component of that, because for those individuals who were on the go, it's not like you can say, hey, sign into this two hour training class or watch this one hour training video when they're having to be out and about and, and doing things. I'm kind of curious if you have anything there that you might be able to share about how you actually work to develop, not just those people who have a more traditional type of job, but those who have a, a deskless type of work, if you don't mind. So for people that were coming in to, to, to work every day, whether those were people in the warehouses or couriers in our express division or any other folks that were having to go into to their normal place of work, we certainly kept doing the things we traditionally would do with the whole idea around keeping people safe. So social distancing, wearing of masks, temperature checks before going into the buildings and sanitation and sanitization. All of those issues were dealt with on a daily basis. And I think we, we coped exceptionally well. And, and I think people really respected that. And so the protocols that we built in early on, we kept in place and we kept working on those over the, over the past 12 months. When it comes to the, the development of people that were working from home, it was a somewhat different arrangement. And, and we, we have a number of what we call certified programs. We have a number of other development programs. And what we did is we started very early on looking at how do we deliver those programs in a virtual world. And so there's been a tremendous amount of work that's been done in that space. And I must say, I, for one, was a bit of a skeptic probably a year ago. I'm no longer a skeptic. And I think that we've realized that there, there are different ways in which we can deliver training and development programs in a virtual uh, way that, you know, probably they don't have obviously the same effect as being in a classroom, but I think the way in which it's been done has been very effective and I'm certainly a convert. And I think we can, going forward, deliver probably a lot more programs in that way. Excellent. I was curious about that one because that's a discussion I've had a lot with different organizations in the last year. Some of them depended solely on in-person, instructor-led, and had that radical shift immediately. And I'm always kind of picking at that thread whenever it comes up to find out how companies adapted and, and adjusted to that. And I'm with you, actually. Even though I do a lot of speaking, do a lot of teaching, things like that. I'm still 
somewhat of a skeptic or was when it comes to just doing a virtual training experience because it feels like you're missing some core element to it, but there are ways to do it very effectively. And there are some ways that doing it that way could be better because you can reach people who in the past couldn't get into that. They couldn't get time out of their schedule to get in that class or they, you know, there was some other barrier preventing them from getting in there. So there's some ways potentially that it could improve that overall long-term uh, for us to be thinking about it differently and just kind of shaking us out of that, that way we've always done it kind of method. So thank you for that. What, one of the things I'd like to ask you is HR can have a different kind of a flavor, a theme, a focus. There's a little bit different bent to it depending on the industry that you're in, right? In the hospitality industry, it has one, one focus. If you're in airlines, it's something else. And so I'm curious about HR and logistics industry, because that's where, that's where DHL operates. That's your, your bread and butter. What is, you talked about some of the big picture things a little bit ago. And I'd love to hear what sort of things are a priority for you and the team because you are in that space, if that makes any sense. Okay. It's real interesting that you raised that question because I don't believe that there is necessarily a, a significant difference in the way in which we deal with HR related issues, regardless of the industry. I think the fundamentals of HR are the same. And I've said this before, whether, whether you're operating in Indonesia, India, or Indiana, right? The basic fundamentals are the same. I think that context and culture certainly impact significantly the delivery. But at the same time, I think the, the essence of human resource management is pretty similar across industries. It takes a bit of a different shape and form. And if I think about our industry, when you look at the, the logistics industry, a large part of that is dealing with what we would call blue collar workers or workers that work in an operating type environment. And, and that I think is, is a little different, but the, the basics around the things that we really believe in around driving employee engagement, regardless of where you happen to work in our organization, whether that, whether that's which division you're part of, whether it, which location you're part of, it doesn't really matter. For the logistics industry, I think it hasn't been one of those industries that has tended to be hugely attractive to, to all and sundry. But I do think when people get into the industry, they tend to, to stay for a long time for the most part. It's, and I think part of that is organizationally, and I mentioned this a little earlier, organizationally as a, as a kind of purpose-driven organization, when people can start connecting the dots in terms of what it is they're doing and why it's important and, and making sure that we provide the kind of environment, it, it really helps drive engagement, it helps drive retention. And I also believe that if, if we can create the opportunities for everybody to grow in the organization, regardless of where you may be or what role you might be performing, I think that has a significantly positive impact on some of the outcomes. Now, we're a massive organization. DPDHL operates in over 220 countries and has 570,000 plus people. So obviously, there are very different parts of the business, which may have different requirements in terms of the kind of people that we, uh, that we might employ or the type of work that they may be doing. What we do try and do is, is provide opportunity for everybody in the organization, regardless of where you might be or, or what role you might be performing. Interesting. All right. So from my outside perspective, just looking at, I'm always making assumptions because I, I haven't done that, right? The, the mm -hmm. HR experience mm -hmm. I've had has been in software. It's been in you know, nonprofits, things like that. And so I'm, I would, I'm making the guess that because the focus is on moving things, moving people from place to place, it, it might be more heavily around, let's find ways to move people inside the business, right? With mobility, or we talked about development a little bit ago, it might be more focused on, let's, we have a weird data driven we have to be on at this place at this time and there's all these factors we have to have perfectly lined up from a supply chain perspective to make that happen and so i'm, I'm always curious if there if those things bleed over into how you look at the talent you have in the business and how that helps you to think about it because at the end of the day the, the leadership in the business outside of hr that's what they care about that's the things mm -hmm. that they're that they're concerned with and I think you said this earlier, right? It's not just about an HR perspective, but it's a, a business perspective applied to HR. And that's the, that's the thing and this nagging at the back of my mind as well as the reason I wanted to ask that one. Yeah, we 
are in the midst of a massive global project around what we're calling job architecture. And it's really looking at how do we create the kind of career paths that we need organizationally so that we can decide what kind of skill sets are required for different jobs and different paths that we have in the organization. And I think it's it's really starting to take shape. And I think that's going to be for us in any event, pretty beneficial when it comes to, to overall development. So people can actually see the kinds of roles that, that they may aspire to and figure out what is it that they need to do to be able to get there. Because as we digitalize more and more, I think we can put people's career development in their hands in a digital type way, I think it's going gonna, it's gonna to create both a number of opportunities, but also a number of challenges, really thinking about some of the traditional ways that we've often done that. So for me, it's going to be a, a real interesting time ahead as, as far as people development in its broad sense is concerned. Those, I've had several conversations in the last month or two with other enterprise companies looking at that job architecture, building a kind of global mobility framework, whatever you want to call it, right? We can call it all kinds of things, skills, ontologies, and we can get really into the weeds on those things. But those ultimately in the day, it's about making this more of a focus on the individual, giving people some power, giving them some control, giving them some opportunity to, to tackle other areas that they, Gordon says, hey, my strengths are in X, Y, and Z. And look, there's a role over here that I'm interested in and I have to use mm-hmm. skills X, Y, and Z and lets you move in that direction. That's it's not simple. It's not easy. And yet long-term it creates, like you said, not just opportunities there, some challenges probably, but some opportunities to really let people do more of that driving in their own career. And that creates the real connection and engagement based on all the research that I've seen. That's really connected to that, letting people have some of that control. So excellent. Oh goodness. Let's come back and, and ping you at some point in the future and, and circle back on that one and figure out that's going. Cause that would be true. That would be tremendous. Yeah. Uh, we're, we're actually developing and we'll very soon be piloting something that we're calling the career marketplace where we try and connect all of those dots in terms of giving people on their mobile device, the opportunity to see what jobs are available to, to look at creating their, their career development paths and so on. And I think it's going to be really interesting to see how people adapt to that and and how organizationally we adapt to that, because it's very different from the way in which I think traditionally we've seen organizations develop people. Yes, absolutely. There's, we just finished some new research on that on, and I asked some questions around that because that's the the talent marketplace is an area that I'm very interested in from a research perspective. And Mm -hmm. I just, I just like to know things. I'm professionally curious and it's been intriguing to see because five years ago, all the conversations I had around a a marketplace to let people develop their own talents and find gigs and things like that internally, those conversations were all led by learning development. And then Mm -hmm. three or four years ago, it was HR bringing a lot of those conversations. And then in the last two years, it's been more talent acquisition saying, how do we find the people inside the business? Let's identify their skills and help them fill these roles. So it's been, that's evolved over time. And it's really just, again, it excites me to think about at the end of the day, those employees having some opportunity to see those roles internally, because most people that you or I talk to aren't, don't go into work saying, I don't want to work here and I want to find the next job somewhere else. It's, I, I would love to have another opportunity if I could just see it, if I have some transparency here. And so that's the exciting part for me around some of those kinds of conversations. I think that's a great, great point you, that you make. And, and the more that you can create the environment and the workplace for people to feel that way and feel positive about the organization, about their own situation and the, around development opportunities and that that kind of, of engagement, I think certainly feeds over to customer connectivity and and customer satisfaction and obviously improved results. And I think philosophically, we have a very firm belief that uh, that is true as an organization. And I think we've made some really good progress in that space. Awesome. Well, I could just snip that little piece out there to answer this question probably, but you might have something else in mind. Any advice for the the HR, the talent leaders listening in? I don't know if it's something that's worked for for you professionally, if it's worked for you and your role there at DHL over the years. I'm curious. I always love just collecting little snippets, little pieces of advice that can help anyone wherever they might be. So anything you might want to share, I think that one, I'll reiterate it now while you're thinking through that answer. But the more you create that environment where people can feel that excitement around opportunities, I think that's at least a good positive long-term outcomes. But what else are you thinking there? When I think about it, I, I really believe that the world of work is, is 
has changed and, and we're not going back to, to where we were pre-COVID. The, the notion around flexible work arrangements that most companies, it, it probably would have taken them five years or more to get to the point that we literally moved to overnight when the situation demanded it. I, I also think that from really understanding HR's value contribution to the business is absolutely critical. I, the basics of HR really need to to be firing on all cylinders, right? So process optimization and all of those things need to be there. One area where I think we will be seeing a lot more activity and attention on is, is around sustainability. And I do believe that Europe is, is somewhat further ahead uh, than the US in, in that space. And if you think about the the three key pillars of environment, social, and governance. HR has a critical role to play, certainly when you think about it from a, a social perspective and a governance perspective. So I think those things are going to be, be with us going into the future. But in terms of advice, ultimately, I think for many people, and, and, and people always used to laugh about this and say, why did you get into HR? And it, because I like working with people. I think realistically, that's probably not so much the case. Yes, it, it's critically important, but I think the way in which we deliver HR services is going to look a little bit different. So I think many of the things for me is really staying connected with your people, staying connected with your customers, staying connected with the, the business are really important. Show that you care. And obviously, when you think about so many people during this COVID crisis that may have lost their jobs or may be living at home or may be trying to balance so many different things around childcare or education or taking care of, uh, of older people. Uh, parents or anything like that, it's really important that organizations show that they care. And I, I think that old adage of people don't care how much until they know how much you care is really important. Setting clear expectations is obviously a big part of that, particularly when you're working in this kind of environment, because the people need to know what is expected of them and how their performance is going to be managed. When in the past, you could just go next door and talk to somebody now it's a little different. And how do we do that? I think is going to be critical. And then something that uh, I, I picked up just last week was uh, listen without solving, which I think is, is really important because the tendency for, for a lot of people is when somebody comes to you with an issue and, and a lot of HR people, I think that would be the case. The immediate response is to try and find a solution to the problem when in fact, that may not be what you need. Listening without solving, I think, was a, a good learning for me just last week in a program that I was, I was listening to. So those are some of the things that I think are important. And I, I do think that for HR people, it's really staying close to what's going on in a broad sense, both from a global perspective as well as from a business point of view. I think it's really important to understand where things are heading so that you can put yourself in a position to be ahead of the curve and cope with that much more effectively. Glad you brought that, the Europe comment on early around the sustainability piece, because I was curious, you know, I have more questions to ask and we have time for me to ask them. But one of the things I was curious about, as you shared earlier, your role not only is focused on the Americas, but you also have a flavor of employee relations throughout other countries, it sounds. And I was curious mm -hmm. if there were things that, that you were seeing that might be other like that, that's an indicator of something that is coming to us because I know the U.S. leads in some ways with tech and some other kinds of things like that, but other more socially focused things are usually brought to us from other countries. And that seems to be just the way things are. I don't know what it is what that says about us as a country, but that's just what I've seen over time. And so I'm glad you brought some of those kind of things in there. And that I laughed, I wrote this down, the, the listen about solving piece, because I think my wife will probably appreciate that piece of advice. If I can figure out how to master that one at home, that will probably save me a little bit of heartache long-term as well. Cause that's always my intention is, okay, I've got a little bit of a, inkling here. Let's go ahead and dive in and, and answer this, even when it's not really, I'm not asking for an answer. I just want to, want, sometimes you just need an ear. You just need someone to bounce an idea off of. You just need someone to think through something with and uh, not always solving that and jumping to that might be the, the best choice there. This has been a lot of fun. I've learned some interesting things and things that I didn't even know about, about the space, about the, the work that DHL does. If someone is curious, wants to know more about the organization or learn more about the kind of work that DHL is doing, what's the best way to connect? They can get hold of, of me at gordon.simpson at dhl.com or they can look at the DHL website. There's, there's plenty of information on there 
or if they want to get hold of me on LinkedIn, uh, they, they can certainly do that. But yeah, we're doing a lot of very interesting things. And I think a lot of things that are positioning us for, uh, for a new world, frankly, really enjoying it. And th- there couldn't be a better time to be in human resource management, I don't believe. I've said that once or twice in the last year, but I've, I really believe it. There's not been a more exciting, interesting time to be doing this kind of work just because things are moving so quickly. And at the, in the midst of all the chaos, people are the center of that. And if we're the people, that gives us a chance to really step up and lead. Yeah, and that's absolutely true. And I, I think that with that sustainability question where, where you were saying what we've been doing, one of the things that we have done, we developed a new uh, human rights policy where, where we focus on certain particular areas. And, and I think the, the key around that is, is to be sure that everybody in the organization from top to bottom understands what that means and what the implications of all of that are. But I think too, from the point of view of our of people that we work for, our suppliers, our customers, everybody else, to really understand what those things mean in practice. And I think there's a huge opportunity to do a lot more in that space. And I'm certainly looking forward to that in the, in the coming months and years. This has been so much fun. I'll make sure and get your LinkedIn profile link into the show notes. People can reach out and connect with you, Gordon. I really appreciate you taking some time to join me today on the show. It's a pleasure. Thank you so much indeed. And you take care. And yeah, it'll be very interesting catching up again with you in sometime in the future and, and talking through some of those issues. Awesome. Wonderful. To everybody else, thank you for hanging out with us today. We're only human. I am Ben Eubanks. We, we heard some great insights today from Gordon. I hope you can go out there again, be a people person, care about your people, listen without solving all the time. And uh, we'll catch you next time. We're only human. Thank you so much for joining me on the show today. I'm honored to have you as a listener. If you enjoyed this episode, please take 10 seconds to rate it at iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to your podcast. Also, if you know a friend that could benefit from today's conversation, please pass it their way. After all, a rising tide lifts all ships. To see show notes, sponsor information, and our full show archives, visit OnlyHumanShow.com. 